next paper is titled Supported Molybdenum and Tungsten Oxides, the Interplay of Precursor Structure, Preparation Procedures and Support. And it's by John G. Eckert, Ryan D. Roark, and Stephen D. Kohler from the University of Texas at Austin. Professor John Eckert will be presenting the, the paper. collaborators in this work uh, that aren't listed on the program. Uh, Clark Williams did some of the early molybdenum work. Uh, some of my re more recent students are working on some information I'll include at the end. Uh, the Raman spectroscopy that I'll talk about uh, in the future has been done in collaboration with uh, Israel Wax from Lehigh and uh, sponsorship from the Department of Energy. Now this overhead uh, summarizes the points that I wish to make uh, today uh, and we'll focus first on the fact that uh, when one prepares in this particular case molybdenum or tungsten and we look at a variety of supports what you find when they are fully oxidized and in an ambient state that you can have coexisting oxide crystallites of the fully oxidized material and a polyanion and that to the amount of crystals that you might have or the absence of crystals does depend on the way in which you prepare these systems. If you resort to non-aqueous preparations on silicas, you can avoid crystals. If you go to other supports like alumina, depending on the loading, you can avoid crystals completely. But one point that we will want to look at is the fact that when you remove the water that is present when these are in an ambient state, there's a dispersion of these polyanions into an isolated structure and in the, on the case of silica, in the case of alumina, uh, these oxide crystals themselves will also disperse. So the effect of the support is on the ability to disperse both the crystal and or the polyanion, but this uh, transferring back and forth between an isolated structure and a polyanion then leads to the uh, conclusion that independent of how you make these, uh, what your precursor is, if you're going to operate between polyanion and isolated structure, you lose all memory of the precursor. So you can use any precursor you want, and you'll transform between these two states. I will not focus on uh, photoreduction of these systems, but when you're going to carry out a catalytic reaction, then catalytic reactions are carried out over uh, oxides that are uh, pre-oxidized or re-oxidized in situ, and so they might contain the crystals as well as these dispersed structures. You can photoreduce these cleanly to uh, an oxidation state, or then uh, you could thermally reduce these to a distribution of oxidation states. What I will focus in on in the end, though, is an ability to form uh, dimer structures that, that do depend on the precursor structure, and we use organometallic precursors for this, and uh, the point here, though, is that we don't oxidize these past the 4 plus oxidation state. So it is possible, and, and we'll see evidence for this, I believe, that supports the presence of uh, reduced cations that are in a lower oxidation state and stable on the surface. Now, um, we measure the point of zero surface charge for uh, cations, in this particular case molybdenum, on alumina and silica. And so what we're doing is we're measuring the pH of the solution that's at equilibrium with these surfaces. And the, the surface itself has, no, has net zero charge, so uh, what we're measuring then is the, uh, we're measuring the pH of the aqueous solution in contact with this. Now, uh, the point I will make using data on the next slide is the following, is that when these uh, samples are in the ambient state, there's water of hydration that it picks up from the atmosphere, and the cations are then solvated by this water of hydration. And this water will be at the pH of uh, the point of zero surface charge corresponding to a particular metal loading. So as you increase the loading of cations on alumina, 
the point of zero surface charge decreases as you do this on silica, it decreases as well. And the structures then for the, this molybdenum at this particular weight loading, 8%, would be, it would experience an aqueous environment that has a pH somewhere near 4. So that point, the effect of this and the consequences of these point of zero surface charge measurements are uh, illustrated on this particular overhead. And uh, what I represent over here is uh, uh, a diagram, of, a phase diagram for the aqueous chemistry of molybdenum. And uh, what I want to, you to focus on is that over a wide range of uh, pHs here, and over a wide range of compositions, the molybdenum-7 polyanion is a very stable structure. Now, when you look at uh, molybdenum on aluminum, the numbers that I have in red here, this is for one weight percent molybdenum, all the way up to 13 weight percent, these numbers in red correspond to uh, taking the water and desorbing it, weighing the amount of water using a TGA to do this, and then our gravimetric in interpretation. So this is the concentration of the molybdenum in this particular sample. This is the concentration that the molybdenum sees in this particular sample. The numbers I have over here correspond to the points of zero surface charge for these systems. And what you find then if you look at the Raman is that the signature that you get at this low weight percent where the pH is around 7, that signature contains the contributions from both molybdenum MOO4 and the, some contributions from the molybdenum polyanion. As you go to higher weight loadings, this band right here, the molybdenum oxygen uh, stretch, goes to, shifts up to about 950, 960, and you see growing in as you do this, uh, this band here at 320 shifts over to around 360. This is a molybdenum oxygen deformation. And you see growing in this band for the molybdenum oxygen molybdenum deformation. And so this bridging structure. The signature of this is assigned to a molybdenum 7 polyanion. Now, uh, interestingly, if you do the, if you use, these were all made using a molonium heptamolybdate. One of the points I made earlier was if you use alumina, you avoid crystallites, but if you use aqueous preparations on silica, you get crystallites. And this is demonstrated with some spectra, Raman spectra that I show you here. Using ammonium heptamolybdate at five weight percent, you see very intense signature for this crystallite. But I will also draw your attention to the weaker feature that you see at 960, which is associated with the polyanion, the same structure that we have here. Now, if you use a, a molybdenum pentachloride, or if you use an allylic precursor or the other precursors that I will talk about in a moment, what we find is the absence of the crystallite, but the signature, and here's this molybdenum oxygen, molybdenum deformation here around 220. The signature here in the interpretation is that this structure in the hydrated state would be equivalent to a molybdenum 7 polyanion, solvated by the water that's present. If we take this, so one of the things that we were working on was uh, looking at using organometallic precursors to prepare uh, discrete structures. And I just wanted to represent some of the complexes that we've worked with, and others have worked with these before. These are uh, allylic precursors. We use a dimolybdenum and a monomolybdenum precursor. We were also interested in some uh, uh, tungsten dimer structures, and so we went to a cyclopentadienyl based uh, precursor, uh, this particular case. Uh, has carbonyl groups, we can follow the attachment process, and uh, the preparation of these is well documented from the literature. They are very air and moisture sensitive, and you have to take care of preparing these, but they're uh, soluble in many solvents and easy to uh, put onto the surfaces as long as you work in aerobic conditions. What I'm going to represent here, let me get the cartoon down here first. I want to show a series of spectra, Raman spectra, for a very high loadings of molybdenum on silica to amplify the ability to avoid forming crystallites. And so over here we have this hydrated structure, the signature then this band at around 950, 960, these are all at 950, uh, this stretch here at around 220 or so, indicative of this polyanion. If you then heat and remove the water of hydration, what we see is that this band moves up to around 990 in this particular case. The band at 220 is gone. Uh, these are all at a variety of different weight loadings, but very, very high weight loadings 
or molybdenum. These are molybdenum. Uh, the basis here is molybdenum metal. So organometallic precursors, not just organometallic precursors, non-aqueous preparation routes on silicon cannabinoid crystallites. If we look at, uh, uh, so we can avoid crystallites. So the question is, is what controls or what limits the loading that you might expect to get on a variety of oxide supports? And what we find in the case, what, what's demonstrated here is that it's the hydroxyls that are consumed uh, during the, this dispersion of these polyanions on the support. And it's the hydroxyl density or the hydroxyl concentration that I feel is integrally connected to your ability to deposit these on the support as well as to disperse the cations once they're on the support of, on silica in this particular case. So all that's represented here is an attenuation of the isolated silanol groups as one increases the weight loading of molybdenum on the surface. And we see that when we get to uh, right around 6 to 6.7 percent, we've essentially consumed all of these uh, 6.4 corresponds to 1.3 molybdenum per nanometer squared, and the free hydroxyl density of silica works out to be, from uh, reports in the literature, around one uh, silanol per square nanometer. So this is all consistent with the consumption of these silanol groups on the surface. I'm going to talk about some organometallic work we've done with tungsten as well, and all of the Raman data that I showed earlier were for silica, excuse me, were for molybdenum. I want to represent here, the, just want to demonstrate that the, the, you see the same thing with the tungsten that you see with molybdenum. These were prepared using the allylic precursor, and again, uh, the hydrated state is uh, heated to remove the water vibration. The band moves to a higher position. Uh, interpretation, again, is a, a spreading uh, in this particular case, it comes in 12 polyanion. And also, uh, when you use uh, aqueous preparations on silica, you find the appearance here of the crystal at uh, very low loadings. So it's, it's impossible, well, I don't know that I can say it's impossible. With Cabasil, with Degusa, with the Rhone Polanc silica, we have not been able to avoid uh, crystallites from aqueous preparations. Uh, Israel Wax tells me that there's a Degusa silica now that allows you to avoid uh, crystallites. So, I, uh, so it may be possible with aqueous preparations to avoid these as well. So what we've seen then is that uh, you form a polyanion. If you look at these in the hydrated state, this structure is given by uh, the, the structure that you would predict uh, is dependent on uh, the concentration of the metal on the surface, which in a sense influences the point of zero surface charge of this pH by this water that's solvating it. And that's how uh, you should think about these, but that when you are going to carry out a reaction over these systems, these polyanions, and in the case of uh, alumina, the crystals themselves will disperse, and you're really starting from a state of uh, not polyanion and not even crystal, but from the state of a dispersed uh, metals or cations on the support. Well, we've been doing experiments with photoreduction and looking at reactions like uh, metathesis over these, and we were interested in asking ourselves if uh, we could carry out reactions and or if we could deposit cations next to each other, because that had been suggested with some of these dimolybdenum allylic precursors, whether it was possible to park cations next to each other. And so we began doing experiments with these uh, tetracarbonyl cyclopentadienyl compounds, and I will show you some infrared data and then some reactions in a little later that uh, demonstrate, I think, fairly clearly that we have these dimer structures present on the support. So let's look at uh, the material from the right-hand side of that figure. And let me put up here a uh, diagram or cartoon that represents what we think was on during the attachment process. We followed in the IR the attenuation of the hydroxyl groups on silica when we expose them to a solution containing, in this particular case, tungsten in a D6 benzene. You can see the hydroxyl groups attenuate. You see the attenuation. You, you see the, you do not see cyclopentadienyl groups after you've done this tethering. So uh, the tungsten is in the plus one oxidation state. We see uh, carbonyl modes that are present both in the precursor as well as when they're on the support. So again, we think that the tungsten is, some of the tungsten is present in this state and it's in the plus one oxidation state. If we then heat to a fair, not that high of a temperature, 
Uh, we can desorb the carbon monoxide ligands. There's a restructuring that's going on. We cannot repopulate the carbon monoxide back into the system. When we do experiments to look at uh, the oxidation state by oxygen nitration experiments, what we find is that these come out, uh, for both tungsten or molybdenum, they come out being in the plus four oxidation state. If you were to then take this system at this point and oxidize it, you would end up with uh, the structures of the isolated and then the polyanion, depending on uh, whether you expose them to ambient or not. If you stop at this particular point, though, then you can interrogate this structure by carrying out reactions. And we'll look at that as well. So to study the deposition process, we use uh, an infrared cell. And, and uh, all that I want to illustrate here is that uh, there's a zone. It's just a quartz cell. That, uh, million different designs for these. There's nothing special to this. We blew windows on the side of a, a glass tube. Uh, there's a quartz zone up here. We can pull the catalyst up or the wafer up into this zone, heat it to a high temperature. Then we can drop this down into the bottom where we have a solution containing the complex. This solution can be withdrawn with a syringe. Uh, we can then drive the solvent off, look at these in the IR. Uh, we can pull them up, heat them, drop them back down. So all the spectra that we look at are after it's been lifted into this heated zone and then the you know, zone. So again, we just dip it, pull it up, remove the uh, solvent or remove the carbonyl ligands and move it back into the infrared zone. There's a problem with these complexes. You can carry these around in your pocket almost if they're out of solution. But once you put them in solution, uh, they will rapidly oxidize. So they're very unstable when they're wet. And we have to handle them wet. Or we can't deliver these by sublimation. So if you put these, this is based on uh, this ability to, in a sense, oxidize this complex. It leads to the evolution. This is based on the synthetic papers that report this evolution of CO, a solid, and you go back to the uh, hexacarbonyl. We made this, I went through that slide very quickly, we make these complexes by buying the hexacarbonyl and uh, just heating these under reflux and diagline and driving CO off to get them to this particular state. So there's, uh, they will transfer back over to this state. Now when we put these in benzene, it's very difficult for us given the uh, liquid cells that we use. These are just uh, infrared optics with a spacer that's hard to keep these in a very uh, moisture-free, air-free environment. What we find then is, uh, and let's just, um, molybdenum's on the bottom. We're going to look at molybdenum in a moment. We find the uh, signature here for the tetracarbonyl mold. We've done these experiments in uh, New Joel, where we don't get this oxidation problem. We characterize these bands. This band is exclusively from tetracarbonyl. There's a contribution here from the uh, some hexacarbonyl that's present during this collection of his IR spectra. And this band is a comp. You get bands from hexacarbonyl and tetracarbonyl contributing at this location. But there's a band at around 1834 that you get from, excuse me, around 1850 for uh, molybdenum, molybdenum. Now, in a moment, we'll look at the same uh, compound on the surface of silica. So this is just in benzene. Here it is in silica. And uh, we've done a uh, large number of these experiments now, and, and we, we keep coming up with uh, uh, this particular result. And, and all I want to show here is that as you deposit these on the surface, we know that when we handle the solids and when we recrystallize these, uh, essentially, we don't think that uh, we're mistreating these. We think that there's an oxidation going on, perhaps during the dipping process or when you contact these to support. So it's unclear at this particular point why we're getting some hexacarbonyl incorporating onto the surface while we're doing these. But clearly what you see is that as you heat the surface from uh, room temperature, these are held at these temperatures for like 30, degree, 30 minutes, what you find then is the desorption of the carbonyl ligands. And finally, what we're left with here is simply the overtone of silica. So the very clean evolution of the ligands from these complexes, this is illustrated. And if we take um, the hexacarbonyl compound, or we take the tetracarbonyl, these are the open squares are for the tetracarbonyl. If we pack a tube, uh, load this silica in a tube with this compound, and then heat it, 
uh, linearly with time, what we see is the evolution of the carbonyl ligands. And this temperature here corresponded to the temperature at which when we collected the IR spectra after 30 minutes of heating, we didn't see the carbonyl ligands. So these ligands come off. Now, we think through the preparation procedure that what we're depositing then is we see the signature for the tetracarbonyl. As we heat these up, these carbonyl ligands desorb. And then we think that what we're left with when this is done is we're left with a template for a reaction that has molybdenum, molybdenum, multiple bonds, and is in the 4 plus oxidation state. So probe reactions that might help us establish that. Uh, I'm going to show you two slides that essentially represent the same reaction. One of these are reductive coupling of ketones, and Mark Barteau talked about this over titania surfaces uh, yesterday morning. One of these articles comes out of Cotton's group, and it's over a tungsten, this particular tungsten complex that has a tungsten double bond. And what they find when they do this particular reaction is that there's a coupling of, in this particular case, ketones to the system, leading to the formation of pinocolates, which uh, they stopped at that particular point. Now, what Mark talked about yesterday was the McMurray reaction, where you take these pinocolates, and if you continue the reaction, you would end up with uh, butene. So, uh, in the article by Cotton, they didn't take it this far, and so that's why there's a question mark on here, but this would be analogous to the McMurray reaction. An alternative over tungsten is a reaction recorded by uh, Chisholm's group, which takes a different alkoxide. Now the tungsten is triply bonded. It's in the 4 plus oxidation state. And what one finds in this particular case is a two-step addition reaction leading first to a carbene, followed by another insertion leading to a very different intermediate than was reported by uh, Cotton's group. Complex is different, remember, leading to, in this particular case, the evolution of uh, olefins. So, a reductive coupling. It's like a metathesis reaction. This is a stoichiometric reaction because when we're done, we have oxidized the metal center. So, I guess you shouldn't talk about non-catalytic reactions at a catalysis society meeting that I am. So, I'm going to show you some data for two different ways of doing this reaction. Uh, one way in which we do this is we take the complex, either molybdenum or tungsten, we put it onto the silica, we remove the carbonyl ligands by heating it, we flow uh, acid aldehyde in this particular case over the system. And when we do this experiment with molybdenum or tungsten, we see butenes, cis and trans 2 butenes, the products that we would expect to see. If you carry this reaction tungsten in the articles that talk about reductive coupling, principally focused on um, the McMurray system of reactions, Tungsten is a much more active system than is molybdenum. So uh, we've done other calibration experiments. If you fully oxidize the tungsten on silica, which is what this system goes to during this reaction, uh, you do see some lighter products. This is done at 350 degrees centigrade to get these products out of our system. Uh, but you don't see the butenes. If you carry this reaction, if you take acid aldehyde with helium over silica at this particular temperature, this is cavacil, you get some lighter products. If you do this over molybdenum that has been photoreduced, isolated and photoreduced, you don't get butenes. So uh, just demonstrating the products that we see, some illustration of this uh, time evolution of these products. At zero time and 350 degrees centigrade, this acid aldehyde stream is passed over the catalyst. This is, uh, these red lines are uh, trans to butene and this is cis to butene. So, there's a very large, there's a large peak at the beginning, and then it attenuates out. Um, if we compare the activities of tungsten and uh, molybdenum using these different precursors, what we find in this particular case, as we would have expected, uh, the tungsten, and you compare the relative amounts of tungsten and molybdenum in these experiments, uh, the tungsten was more active than was the molybdenum. So uh, we feel, let me uh, just summarize at this point. We don't even have to stand up, Harold. <laughs> let me summarize. One of the points I wanted to make, and it's not listed here, is that uh, the structure that you get when these are fully oxidized, aside from crystallites, it doesn't matter how you make these, what your precursor is. 
if you buy into this moving between a state with water present and a state without water present. And the uh, interpretation that we give to the Raman data is that it's a polyanion that's solvated by the water, and then when you remove the water, it spreads. So that's the interpretation uh, that we provide for the Raman results. And uh, the structures that you get when they're fully hydrated are dependent, I guess, the point of zero surface charge changes with the loading, and because this point of zero surface charge changes, the structure changes. But at very low, low loadings on silica, you get the same structures that you get on alumina at much higher loadings. And the reason for this is that you're always at a low point of zero surface charge. And so it's not so much the loading as the point of zero surface charge that the system has. The hydroxyl groups play a critical role in this tethering process with these organometallic precursors. The hydroxyl groups also play a role in your ability to disperse and spread the cations on the surfaces of uh, silica and likely with uh, alumina as well. We haven't done those experiments on alumina. And I think uh, more, we can also say that uh, if you use these complex, if you use these complexes, and it may also be true with the uh, olylic precursors as well except there's no way that we haven't tested that, uh, that if you can put these down and keep these from being coming fully oxidized, it may be possible then to prepare uh, metal centers that are coordinatively unsaturated and have multiple bonding. And uh, we're beginning to look at the catalytic chemistry the metathesis is one reaction over these systems as well as the isolated systems. Thank you very much. The questions, the comments? In effect, uh, regulate the coverage by the absorbed uh, species by changing the hydroxylation of the surface. Then when you use vapor phase deposition technique, then you can show that the number of molybdate uh, species or vanadate species, whichever they are, uh, is limited by the number of hydroxide groups. So that when you uh, neutralize all the hydroxides, you just stop covering, covering even at sub-monolayer coverages. So there is a direct proof that you uh, that the hydroxides are involved and that you have practically no spreading over these hydroxides in such technique. Of course, when you are using impregnation from the water solution, you are first hydroxylating, hydroxylating the surface completely, and then you get uh, the coverage, uh, monolayer coverage. John, I just wondered if you uh, had uh, recarb 